And one of the things that will be uh, a common theme, I think, through the course, and I think a common theme now through much of the research that's going on in, in experimental basins and forested catchments, is that we no longer rely solely on physical measurements to come up with how we might conceptualize the runoff process to work in our basin, or even to uh, calibrate or validate our models. What we're realizing more and more is that we need to constrain our understanding or our model or our concepts by physical, chemical, and isotopic uh, data. Meaning that if one looks solely at groundwater response and stream flow response, you might see that the two are, you know, happening in concert with one another. So here's discharge versus time. Maybe we've got a, a stream hydrograph in response to some storm uh, rainfall. And then we might have a, a groundwater well some meters away. And, you know, the groundwater well is kind of, is kind of tracking this, this stream hydrograph. And you might say, well, gosh, the, the groundwater well is doing this, the stream hydrograph is doing this, then perhaps the groundwater is what's driving the stream water in that case. But if we looked at the isotopic composition of the stream and we saw no expression of groundwater, or we looked at the, the chemical composition of the stream and we saw no groundwater end member, or maybe it was a different end member, soil water or some other type of geographic source contributing to flow, this would help to really resolve uh, what we might be conceptualizing, how the system might work. Similarly, if we relied only on the chemistry and we ignored the physical response, I think likewise it could be a dangerous way to proceed. So more and more, we're really wanting to constrain how we understand a system using these techniques. And when I say isotopic, I mean things like uh, oxygen-18 or deuterium. These are... Uh, part of the natural water molecule and increasingly are used as conservative tracers in forest watershed hydrology studies. And again, we'll talk a little more about that as the morning goes on. The other thing we'll make passing reference to, oops, there's a typo there, is uh, how different scientists might view a catchment. So, you know, an experimentalist might go out to a landscape like this and think, oh, geez, there's, there's preferential flow and there's all of these kind of interesting complexities in terms of how the runoff process might work. And this might be based on their training in soil science. And I know there are soil scientists here that, you know, this is, this is a, a way to kind of look at the world. But maybe you've got a, a civil engineer who's charged with coming up with a model of how the system works. And this is way too detailed, even though it is very important in terms of uh, perhaps explaining how water infiltrates to depth. This is actually a visualization of a, a, a dye staining study where water is irrigated on the forest floor. Uh, and this, these, uh, I don't know if you can see that very well, but these darker markings indicate where water has penetrated through earthworm burrows. And this is now a, a kind of a, a, a visualization of, of that or an image of that. But the, the, the engineer might need to put together a rainfall runoff model and you know, has some boxes to work with, but can't write that into uh, some kind of uh, nonlinear or, or uh, can't derive this equation very easily. This is really complex stuff that defies simple analytical description. So we'll talk about this, uh, this dialogue between experimentalists and modelers as we go along, because I think this is also important in shaping what we do in forest hydrology today. No longer are we in two separate camps, experimentalists or modelers, but often we need to do both. We need to both describe perhaps the dominant processes in a given system and also what, how we might uh, model that in terms of making predictions in the future. So we've just gone through this introduction. We'll now look at an overview of some of the main runoff generation concepts that I'm, I'm thinking many of you are already familiar with, and then look at some of these processes at the uh, plot, hill slope, and catchment scale. We'll then spend some time looking at watershed modeling that embraces some of these uh, concepts and then try to conclude.
Now, I know a lot of you are from different parts of the country, and I'm going to try and draw on as many different examples from sites where my PhD students and postdocs have been working. Uh, the Huntington Forest in upstate New York is uh, one of the sites I'll try to make reference to. Uh, Sleepers River in Vermont has a, was a USDA site and is now a USGS web catchment, water, energy, biogeochemical budgets. Uh, so is the Panola watershed in Georgia. It's also a web catchment. Uh, Dry Creek in New York is a headwater basin in the New York City water supply in the Catskills. Uh, Reynolds Creek, USDA basin outside of Boise, uh, where we've done some work. And I know there's some folks in, from eastern Oregon or semi-arid intermountain areas here. Uh, the Maybe So in southeast Alaska, I'll make some passing reference to towards the end for uh, Rick Woodsmith's uh, benefit. And uh, maybe there's someone else here from, from uh, Alaska. Uh, the H.J. Andrews and uh, Central Sierra Snow Lab, in, uh, not so far from here, at near Donner Pass. And then some other sites where we've been working, uh, Mai Mai in New Zealand, which is very similar to uh, the northwest U.S., steep, wet uh, environment. Svartberget in uh, northern Sweden, I'll show some data from there. Uh, Fudoji in, in uh, Honshu Island in Japan. And then some data of uh, the Melbourne group from Tarawara which is uh, some really exciting data that's been published uh, in the last couple of years I, that I'm not associated with, but I want to I show you. Okay, so uh, overview of runoff generation concepts or ideas. And what this section is going to look at then are what are these main concepts, what, what studies have contributed to these now common perceptions of runoff generation, and again, if you're interested in this further, I'd encourage you to download those uh, benchmark papers and uh, I can lead you towards other sources if you're interested. And then thinking about this as a broad conceptual framework for the rest of the class so that when we delve into the plot scale or the hill slope scale, it's not so obscure, but it's somehow linked to these dominant uh, processes. So really, our, our history is, is, uh, is shown here in this slide. You know, back in the early 30s when Horton was active at his uh, experimental facility in his backyard in Vuhersville, New York, uh, he did a lot of work looking at how rainfall intensity might exceed soil infiltration capacity and produce what we call infiltration excess overland flow. And this was a widely held view and in fact is the basis for many of the operational watershed models that are used today in consulting and in, uh, in practice, uh, and this was elaborated on by Betson in the early 60s who said, well, you know, these areas, these, these zones of limited infiltration aren't uniformly distributed over the landscape. Uh, there are, they're more patchy and they're related to perhaps differences in land use. And Betson came up with a partial area concept that kind of modified these ideas. But forest hydrologists, you know, in the late 50s, late 40s, early 50s, began to recognize that in forest landscapes, rarely does rain intensity or snow melt intensity exceed soil infiltration capacity. And ideas related to variable source area theory by Hewlett and others with the Forest Service and, and uh, UGA in Athens began to elaborate on the dual process of subsurface storm flow where soil water or transient groundwater might uh, in steep enough terrain and transmissive enough soils contribute significantly to the storm hydrograph. And some of the classic papers by Daryl Wayman in the early 70s and Dennis Haar at the Andrews in 77. And then this idea of saturation excess overland flow, where now saturated areas develop, but it's due to saturation from below rather than saturation from above, meaning that the area maybe around the margins of active stream channels they expand and contract due to storage being filled in this zone and water tables rising to intersect the soil surface. And as these water tables intersect the soil surface, this is a zone that produces overland flow, but saturation excess overland flow rather than this infiltration excess, where the water table could be some distance below the surface. Now, there are many variations on these themes, but this might be the kind of simplest uh, way to represent these, these processes. And at point, whether or not one is falling into one or all of these categories, because these aren't, uh, these aren't uh, 
a watershed is rarely solely one type of runoff mechanism. It, it could exhibit all of those and more during an event, depending on things like rain intensity or amount. Many catchments where, you know, during a certain rainfall intensity, the catchment is dominated perhaps by saturation excess overland flow, and then you get a high intensity burst or you change the intensity and now you've actually uh, exceeded the soil's infiltrability. And now it might be producing widespread, widespread infiltration excess overland flow. Antecedent wetness conditions can have a large effect. You could have, as you probably know, a rain event or a snowmelt event on a, a catchment of you know, fairly low antecedent wetness and maybe there's very little response but after, in, under wetter conditions that same event could affect a much, much larger response. So there are distinct thresholds and nonlinearities often in how these processes turn on and off. Uh, soils and vegetation, not surprisingly. Soil type, soil depth is a, is a big effect, has a big effect on developing zones of transient saturation. Depth to the water table and, and topography, topographic convergence, and then geology. This we'll talk about a lot at the catchment scale and where if you're in permeable bedrock material or impermeable material, this can radically alter the behavior of a, a watershed in terms of the questions that we'll be uh, looking at. So again, this, this basic review that I'm thinking you've all seen before, uh, conditions for infiltration excess, we won't go through and derive the infiltration equations. There's actually a web module by uh, David Tarbotten at Utah State University that he developed for the National Weather Service uh, some years ago. And if you're interested in infiltration excess overland flow, he has a very good module within a module on this topic. And there are exercises that you can go through. You can solve green amped equation, Horton infiltration equations, and it's a, a really good quantitative treatment of this topic. But typically, we're in areas where maybe uh, potential evapotranspiration exceeds evapotranspiration. Perly, poorly permeable bedrock. Uh, I was in Tucson a couple of weeks ago giving a talk, classic example where you know soils are very poorly developed, underlying substrate is uh, quite impermeable and rainfall intensities are very very high. But often this is restricted to arid and semi-arid areas. In humid areas infiltration excess is uh, much less common unless of course you're dealing with uh, disturbed environments like uh, in a, in a suburban setting, lawns, parks, forest roads. Yeah? Yeah, uh, well, if you're in the, in the coast range here in northern California, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the bedrock is uh, sandstone. So even though the slopes are very, very steep, and you might have very wet period through the wintertime in that kind of Mediterranean climate, uh, you may see very little, if any, lateral flow through the soil prism. In fact, one of the most embarrassing moments of my career was uh, doing an elaborate trenching study in the Coast Range where we did some experiments, dye tracing experiments, where we saw dye move down to the soil tie sandstone interface, and we saw some backing up at that zone, and we were convinced on these steep slopes that if we uh, excavated a trench, kind of like putting in a forest road, we would see lateral flow at that interface. Anyway, we, we put all this effort into putting these trenches in. Over two years, zero lateral flow at that interface. The communication between the soil and the permeable bedrock was such that we did not, over that two-year period, produce any lateral flow at that site. This was really surprising, and I think really kind of hit home how the bedrock permeability and that it's the nature of the contact, really, or it could be layers in the, in the soil or, you know, if you're, in the, if you're in the coastal plain in South Carolina and you've got sandy soil uh, underlain by some argillic horizon, you know, that can be a, a hot spot for uh, initiating lateral flow. But bedrock is, is really key as I came to find out the hard way. Now other factors, of course, that can promote this infiltration excess overland flow might be fire. So here's a burn site. Uh, this is the Lucky Butte fire uh, in the Western Cascades in Oregon. Here we've done some sprinkling experiments, going in with a backpack sprayer and trying to irrigate at rain intensities comparable to wintertime rain intensities in this area. And here you can see this very thin layer, 
where the dye has impregnated that uh, hydrophobic surface. But what's interesting is that now this, this infiltration excess is created in an environment where we would not have seen this, because these are very permeable soils otherwise. But it, it now creates a zone where there's ponding in the microtopographic depressions on these hill slopes. And what's interesting, we saw interesting uh, preferential flow features with water now being funneled in these topographic depressions uh, through some cracks that might exist in this, in this uh, hydrophobic layer and water going to depth and then exploiting that lower subsurface to move laterally uh, down slope. So in fact this hydrophobicity could also be seasonal hydrophobicity. If you're in New England you might find in your forest settings that you get some you know after a dry spell in the summer you could have that first wetting up afterwards some uh, hydrophobicity in the organic horizons. Uh, this being a, uh, quite an extreme example. Uh, and here's obviously, uh, you know, logging roads can, can also create this kind of runoff behavior. Now the key thing in terms of timing is that this is orders and orders of magnitude greater than what you would see as flow and porous media through the matrix, even if you're on uh, steep transmissive hill slopes. So this is why detecting where these areas might be and their connectedness to a stream channel is really important. Now that connectedness is important not only for infiltration excess but saturation excess. You could have pockets of you know, surface water but if they're not connected to a channel in some way that can allow that zone to participate on the time scale of an event then it may not be as, uh, as, as, as important in terms of rapid runoff generation. Now there's a recent paper you might have a look at. This uh, re-examines some of Horton's early works and looks at the uh, prevalence of this infiltration excess overland flow in the New York City watersheds. This is by a group at Cornell. And what they found is that even in Horton's backyard, Horton shouldn't see Horton overland flow because uh, rain intensities, that looking at kind of this rain climatology that they did, uh, rarely would one expect to ever see this kind of runoff behavior.